Yes? Okay. Children with cerebral palsy present a lot of difficulty in performing a number of upper limb tasks. And this difficulty has been demonstrated in studies that compared individuals with cerebral palsy with those with typical development. And what they find is that children or teenagers with cerebral palsy have worse performance. They're slower and they're less precise in a number, a whole host of different tasks, for example, reaching to a target. And they also find differences in movement pattern. In particular, they find that movement at the distal joints, such as the elbow and the wrist, is reduced, and movements at more proximal joints, such as the shoulder and the trunk, is increased. Now the question is, what is the nature of these atypical patterns? and how they relate to reduced performance. The most common answer you find, in particular in the rehabilitation literature, is that these atypical patterns are context-independent manifestations of the brain injury, and that they are the cause of worse performance. So a very direct linear relation is made between component movements and performance, and not surprisingly, people try to target or normalize atypical patterns to get improved performance. And as we saw last afternoon, this has not been very successful, which pushes us to investigate further into the nature of reduced performance. Experiments with typical adults with absolutely no brain injury gives us some direction into an alternative answer. So these individuals, when performing a task such as reach to a target, and when they are challenged, when precision is, very high precision requirements are involved, or when their action capabilities are reduced, they are forced to use their non-preferred limb, you get reduction in movements at distal joints, such as the elbow and the wrist, and you get increases in movements of the shoulder and the trunk, so surprisingly, movement patterns show up in typical individuals in challenging situations that are quite similar to the movement patterns that are considered characteristic of individuals with cerebral palsy. So we have to consider here the possibility that these patterns are adaptive rather than pathological. And this is not a new claim. I'm just trying to flesh it out in an upper limb task now. So what is the nature of atypical movement patterns and reduced performance? An alternative answer is that atypical patterns might not be context-independent manifestations of the brain injury, and the relation between atypical patterns and worse performance might not be reductive. They might be more complementary. These atypical patterns might reflect adaptive solutions to sustain satisfactory performance when their reduced capabilities affects compliance with test performance. So this experiment I'm going to present is somehow getting into this particular issue. I'm trying to see or test it, evaluate this explanation. So we looked to see whether the differences typically seen between individuals with cerebral palsy and individuals with typical development are context dependent. We looked into differences in movement patterns and differences in performance. And our hypothesis is that these differences would be affected or would be actually larger when higher task demands interact with reduced capabilities. So they would be context dependent. And we used the opportunities to investigate further into this relation between performance and movement patterns. So what was the experiment? We had nine teenagers with cerebral palsy and 11 teenagers with typical development, and they were performing a reciprocal aiming task, or FITS task. So the task is to move between two targets continuously as fast as you possibly can without missing the target. So that's the task. And cannot miss the target means precision was required. If they made a mistake, they had to start over so that we could actually use speed as the measure of performance. 
So participants stood in front of a table. So they were in the upright position. The table had adjustable height, so it was basically aligned with the pelvis of the participants. Targets were positioned on this table. And participants used a rod that was about 50 centimeters long and 40 grams of weight to touch the targets back and forth. So we manipulated precision demand. So we had an easier condition where the diameter of the targets were about 10 centimeters and a more difficult condition where the width of the target was six centimeters, basically the best an individual with CP could do in our uh, task. The execution demand was also manipulated. So we put a 50 gram mass either close to the hand, so mass close to the hand, less force required to move, it would be the less demanding condition, and mass far away from the hand being the more demanding condition. And we also asked both groups of participants to do the task either with their preferred or not affected hand or non-preferred or affected hand. And we measured two things. As I said, we measured performance and movement pattern. For performance, we used movement time and that was the average time to move the handheld rod between the two targets. And we measured this from a marker positioned close to the tip of the rod. And the movement pattern was the magnitude of motions of the elbow, shoulder, and trunk, which we measured using markers positioned at particular segments. So here are the results. I'll talk about performance first. So on the y-axis we have movement time, and then we have the different targets, 10 and 6 and preferred and non-preferred hand. So we replicated literature results in the sense that individuals with CP performed worse, they were slower. So the group in orange or yellow is the CP group. You see movement times are across the board larger. But it was not context independent. We had a group limb precision demand interaction. So what was that? So there was an interaction between task environment factors and individual actual capabilities, such that differences were larger with the non-preferred hand, in particular when the task was very hard. So that's where the largest differences showed up. Now movement pattern. So let's look at the elbow movements first. We again got a three-way interaction. And here on the y-axis now we have the magnitude of elbow motion. And as you can see, as expected from the literature, CP children had smaller magnitudes, but that was not context independent again. They showed up only when the non-preferred limbs were compared, and in particular for the smallest target. Differences were greater there. Now shoulder movements. We had a group limb interaction, not context independent again. So we had, on the y-axis now we have magnitude of shoulder motion and these changes just showed up when the non-preferred limb was used. So we do replicate the literature in that you have smaller magnitudes of elbow motion, more distal joint, and increased magnitude of shoulder motion, more uh, proximal joint. But these differences, this strategy, was not context independent. Again, it only showed up at more demanding conditions. When reduced capability encountered the need for these capabilities, such as when a small target was used. So again, not context independent manifestation of brain injury. So perhaps the identified movement strategy reflects an adaptive solution to sustain satisfactory performance when their reduced capabilities was actually required. So how might moving a larger segment then help with precision demands? And my answer is it creates greater resistance to motion, fric friction. So it creates stability in hand positioning and there is evidence for that. And now how this movement strategy might be compensating for reduced action capabilities. What reduced action capability? 
Well, the capability to stabilize the end effector close to the target, in particular when you're using the smaller segments, the smaller distal segments. And why do I think it's harder for the smaller distal segments? Because there is evidence that these people have, or CP children have difficulty fine-tuning the activation of distal muscles. So the price to pay here is performance reduction. Why? Simply because now you're moving more massive body segments, and this has been found in typical individuals also. When more massive body segments, when you're moving to targets in directions that you have to recruit more massive body segments, you move slower. So that's the price to pay. But now if you want to improve performance, you can't just go and normalize the movement, you want to find a better balance between precision demands and action capabilities. So the argument here is that these strategies are actually improving the fit between environment and agent for test performance. They're good for test performance given the reduced capabilities of these individuals. Now the trunk pattern. Interestingly, they were similar between individuals with CP and typically developing children. Actually, they were increased in a similar fashion for both groups when precision demand increased. So both groups increased trunk movement. Interestingly, however, children with CP increased trunk motion more so than children with CP when they used the more demanding tool for the small target. So we had a group tool target interaction that I want to exploit here with you a bit. So we had greater increases in trunk motion in children with CP when they were obligated to use the, worse, the more demanding tool. But we did not find that that resulted in greater increases in movement time for these children. So movement time increased in the same fashion for both groups. So we have differences in motion and basically equal effects in performance. So again, the relation between movements and performance is not univocal. And in fact, the greater magnitude of trunk movement in children with CP seems to have guaranteed comparable changes in performance as a function of the changes in the tool. So actually trying to normalize the trunk movements make it look like typically developing children might be actually not so good. <laughs> you may affect performance negatively. So I want to exploit this a little more because I think there is a, a nice lesson here. So you have differences in movement patterns that did not result in differences in performance. So what I think is that these adjustments in movement patterns are actually the required transformations for functional equivalence under different task conditions. So I see movement patterns really as the transformations required to sustain agent-environment relations that are appropriate for test performance as the environment changes, as the individual changes. So what did we find? We found the differences expected between unilateral children with unilateral cerebral palsy and typically developing children, we found that both in movement pattern and performance, everything everybody found, we found. But we found that these differences are context dependent. They increase as task demands taps into capabilities that are at fault. And we found evidence that movement patterns and performance are complementary rather than the relation is complementary and not reductive. You don't have one causing the other. You have one supporting and driving the other. Because of the nature of the symposium, I'll do my clinical implications. So I've been, for the last six years, working very hard in trying to approximate, because I'm in the physical therapy department, uh, approximate theory and practice. So when my students are faced with a patient with reduced performance in the presence of a movement disability, I keep asking them the questions, what are the underlying differences between this individual and individual, typical individuals that actually matter and should shape intervention? And I think this study provides evidence that it's not really the movement patterns per se. Oh shoot, 
We corrected it. Damn it. Per se, I know it's as e now. So what should shape our interventions is not the idea of prescribing a correct, a normal pattern, such as let's constrain movements of the trunk in people that increase movements of the trunk, because that actually might be a good thing for performance. What we actually need is to be able to look at how effective these movement patterns that are showing up in promoting task-sensitive agent-environment relations. And evaluating this effectiveness might actually require us to bring into more um, analysis and tools that will have us look into a different level of analysis, such as the coordination patterns are stable enough, or um, the behavioral dynamics is what you want with that different pattern. But then to improve performance, when the movement strategies used are not effective, you have to find out what's preventing the fit. And that was the challenge at the clinic all the time. What's preventing the fit? What environmental properties? What individual properties? What relations are not being sustained such that performance wasn't good? And now I'm going to use a quotation from Dobry Dotov, which is, addressing the disability should rely on, should rely on correcting or compensating for the flawed agent-environment interaction and not merely trying to forcibly reconstitute the form of the movement to its paradigmatic, paradigmatic healthy state. And with from Marisa. Oh, wow, yeah, so, so, okay, so Marisa. So there you go. So, I thought you wrote it. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank my co-authors and funding agencies.